So we're tasked today to discuss a little bit in um, under 20 minutes about the low carbon transition, its challenges, the status and the possibilities, which of course is an immense challenge. So today we'll be speaking a lot about the challenges, a little bit about the status and inspire a little bit on the possibilities that we also in cities are exploring. Um, I'll jump through who I am because I was so perfectly introduced, uh, but we'll go directly into the challenge. And climate change is, of course, the biggest challenge of our time. We can see here this very, very long time scale that showcases in the last 11,000 years how the temperature, average temperature on the Earth, has been ev uh, evolving. And you can see in the last, actually, century how quickly the temperature has risen. And the real problem here is uh, not too much the scale at which this is uh, changing, but really the time that it has taken for almost one degree to be taken up uh, since the beginning of the, the century. And just in a couple of decades, being able to change to cause that many changes is of course very worrying. And if we go to the root of the problem, we of course know that it's about CO2. The only thing I'll say about CO2 is that CO2 is a very inert molecule. Uh, there's basically only two ways that you remove CO2 from the atmosphere uh, naturally. Either it happens through photosynthesis, uh, capturing um, in, in plants, for example. And the second piece is if it uh, dissolves into water due to pressure differences. And that basically means that in the end, CO2 is a molecule that stays in the atmosphere uh, between centuries and millennials, depending on exactly how you look at it and how you calculate things. But this means that CO2 should be treated as debt. It's bad debt for our children or grandchildren because it will not be removed naturally unless we take it down in the timescales that matter to us. A last piece that uh, was published uh, not too long ago is also related to the consequences of climate change. So we humans have basically one natural mechanism to regulate our temperature. And it's basically through uh, the emission of sweat on our bodies, the latent energy contained in uh, the liquid when it evaporates, uh, basically creates a cooling effect on our skin. So this means that our ability as humans to cool down naturally depends on the humidity in the air. So the ability for this sweat to evaporate. And so we have some analysis now to start showcasing that depending on what year you're looking at, and this is the graph to the right here, and depending on which IPCC scenario you're looking at, we could be looking at scenarios where 30% of the global land area is inhabitable. Inhabitable meaning that you would have extreme conditions for more than 20 days, and extreme conditions would represent area where the combination of temperature and humidity is so high during those days that the human body naturally can't cool, which would result in natural in the need for having artificial cooling mechanisms. And it goes without saying that uh, in a world where we have even more um, constraints on our energy supply because we need to shift away from fossil fuels, anything that relies on introducing more energy usage to enable humans to survive will be complicated. So this is a double constraint that we will be looking at. Very, very timely uh, regarding the, the, the sanitary situation is what would it take to actually get to a two degree path? So if you take the lockdown that happened in the beginning of the year, if you smooth it out on the yearly basis, that represents between minus five and minus 10% of annual reduction in emissions. Coincidentally, this happens to be roughly what is needed in order to get to the two degree Paris Agreement uh, that we've set ourselves. So what this means is that they, we need to have one COVID triggered, one big lockdown a year in order to represent and yield the carbon reductions that we would need to get on the, on the two degree path that you, that you can see on this line here. This showcases a little bit the size of the challenge. And you can see, for example, that the current trajectory is not at all, uh, we're not at all in the right direction. And you can see the Paris uh, pledges. So everything that the countries have said they would be doing also is not enough. So even the commitments are not high enough. So again, this showcases a little bit the challenges that we're facing here and the magnitude of things. And why do we have those uh, challenges in the first place? So the real issue here is fossil fuels. And 
we are really addicted to fossil fuels. So we have to remember that basically cheap oil and cheap fossil fuels are the energy um, that, that has, have enabled us to um, go from a civilization which was very, very primitive to a civilization where we have enormous energy usage and where we have the living standards we have nowadays. And even on a global scale, most of the energy supply that we have comes from fossil fuels, as you can see from those graphs. And of course, you have the new renewables and the old renewables, hydro and so on, that are still increasing, but not at all fast enough uh, co compared to the pace of the other ones. The example I typically uh, used to take to get an idea of, of why oil is still so present is if you look at one liter of oil, that represents roughly orders of magnitude 10 kilowatt hour of, of uh, thermal energy. And it costs, again, order of magnitude roughly one euro, and it weighs almost nothing. It's very portable, which makes it perfectly suitable for transportation. If you take a Tesla Powerwall, um, the storage unit, last time I checked, again, orders of magnitude, you would get something that costs thousands of euros uh, for 10 kilowatt hours, also roughly of storage, and weighs 100 kilos. So I have several order of, of magnitudes difference uh, between oil and a battery. And so technology still has um, steps to get to a place where we can aggressively and efficiently substitute cheap oil from the system. It's going to happen, but right now we still see the trend, unfortunately, not, not changing. Let's look at the positive and the brighter side of this, uh, because it's the biggest challenge of our time, but it's also the biggest opportunity of our time. So if we step back for a second, we have to realize that energy is our ability to transform our environment. It's the ability to mold things, to heat things up, to change shapes, to create movement. And physicians typically call it energy. You could say economists call it GDP, because in the end, it's, it's the same, it's two faces of the same coin. And because more than 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels, this means that we need to reinvent 80% of the way we do things. And this is a terrific opportunity to reinvent our world. And this is going to cause, and it is currently causing, the most profound transformation in history. We have to watch out for some pitfalls. I'm gonna mention one specific, uh, which is the rebound effect. So new technologies typically almost always induce more usage, thus more emissions. A typical example is if you make a car that has a more efficient engine that will reduce the cost of that car, which means that people will now afford a larger car or afford to drive more kilometers. And so you typically have a rebound effect that happens uh, where you end up using the asset more. And in the end, the total amount of emissions associated to it increases. So energy efficiency needs to be constrained by a, a control of its associated increased usage because else you're just increasing the total amount of emissions. And we've seen that with some use cases in IT, for example. This is why carbon accounting needs to be ubiquitous, standardized and enforced by everyone to make sure that we don't have this rebound effect and that we're using technological improvements in order to reduce global emissions. I'm gonna quote one sentence from Greta Thunberg that I think is, is actually very, very on point on this. And she says that the real danger is when companies and politicians are making it look like real action is happening, when in fact, almost nothing is being done apart from clever accounting and creative PR. And I'm gonna insist a little bit on the clever accounting because I believe this is really the challenge that we are facing currently. Um, one that I found pretty funny is the zero emission vehicle, where we're saying, you know, your, your electric vehicle is basically always clean uh, bec because it doesn't emit anything. Um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have an exhaust pipe, so it doesn't em emit any CO2. And the real challenge is that it always depends on what electricity you're putting into it. And you can see here a study that was done uh, now a couple of years ago that showcases the climate impact of driving one, uh, of using one, or driving a kilometer per car, um, depending on which country that electricity comes from. And you can see there are some countries, uh, low carbon countries, like you'd have Sweden, for example, um, where the impact could be, you know, minus 85% compared to a diesel vehicle. Whereas if you look just as Poland, which is dominated by coal power plants, then you haven't gained that much. And of course, there's a very high variance depending on which electric vehicle you look at it explicitly. 
but I think the, the, the signal is there. We need to make sure we accurately compute things and that we have this data-driven basis on which we make decisions because else we won't make the best decisions. Another piece where we go a little bit deeper into things is how do you account actually for the origin of electricity? Um, and so the greenhouse gas protocol defines two methodologies for doing so. One is the so-called location-based approach, which basically looks at uh, what is the electricity that is physically available in a given location. And so if you have, for example, 33% wind, a third percent wind, and a third of coal, and two thirds of coal, sorry, then you would say as a consumer, if I'm connected to that grid, I would get a third wind and two thirds coal. But there's another methodology uh, because at some point we came with a wonderful idea of saying that when a wind turbine produces electricity, we could sell the electricity and we could sell its greenness separately on two different markets. And so that means that you can inject electricity to an electricity network from a wind turbine, which is not green anymore because we have sold the greenness to a, with a certificate to a direct consumer. And this means that as a consumer connected to that grid, if I buy the certificate, I get 100% you know, wind. But if I don't buy the certificate, then I shouldn't be fooled into thinking that I'm getting a third wind like in the previous case, because actually that greenness has been bought by someone else. I'm not necessarily aware of it, but I will then get the rest of the mix, which is 100% coal. And so the challenge with having both methodologies mean that two consumers can claim the, the same greenness. I can have someone being physically claiming that they are wind power because they get the third on the left side of the picture here. And I can get someone here saying that I'm also green because I bought the certificate. And so that, doesn't, that simply doesn't match up. So I think this is also something where we have to be really careful about, do we, do we treat things um, as an accounting methodology, such as the left side, this is an accounting methodology, or as a subsidy system. And if you really think about it, the way that we're issuing certificates is not to really document origin of electricity, it's actually to create a subsidy system, a system where we're saying, let's fund more renewables. And I think this is where we need to be very, very clear on what tool is getting used. And I think this is the only way we're gonna be able to create the right type of data that creates the right type of incentives in order to transition as fast as possible to a low carbon energy world. This of course showcases a lot of different challenges and I wanted to pick up a few examples of what we've done at Tomorrow together with cities on um, building this data-driven future and enabling anyone to take better decisions. Um, so very quickly, one of the best ways to get rid of fossil fuels is to electrify things. And as I mentioned before, um, electricity, we need, always need to ask ourselves, is it, is it really clean actually? Um, this is, an, uh, is a huge machine. You can see here, uh, look, look at the size of the tractor here to the, to the right side. And that showcases you a little bit how big this, this mine is um, in Germany. And we have just to remember that still nowadays, most of the electricity is actually generated uh, using fossil fuels, unfortunately. So we built something called the electricity map that showcases in real time the origin of electricity. And that enables us to collect a lot of data. You can see here in uh, an animation, let's hope it, it loads. There you go. This showcases us an animation over Europe uh, over a couple of days of how quickly and the electricity system changes over time. So the greener a country is, the lower its carbon intensity is. And the carbon intensity is the amount of greenhouse gas emitted for each kilowatt hour you are consuming in that country uh, for example, if you were to put your electric vehicle to charge. I'm quite fascinated by countries like Spain and Portugal to see how quickly they oscillate depending on the weather conditions. Where countries like, or a country like Germany, we clearly see the daily patterns um, related to the amount of solar capacity they have installed. So with all this data came an interesting question, which is the origin of marginal emissions. So if I'm a consumer, on connected to the grid, I have an electric vehicle, and I want to figure out what's the best time to charge my, electric, my electric vehicle. I need to understand what are the so-called marginal carbon emissions. So what happens is when I'm asking a little bit of more electricity from the electricity system, 
not all power plants will be delivering that, that extra marginal electricity. It will be the first power plant or the cheapest power plant that still has spare capacity. And that can be detected by ranking here, as in this picture, all production sources by the, from cheapest to most expensive, um, looking at where the, command, the current demand resides, and then everything to the right is basically power plants that have still spare capacity, and we're taking the cheapest one, and that will give us an idea of what is the marginal origin of electricity. Now, the, the problem is that this, this curve here is very sensitive, it's secret, because if you knew it, it would allow you to bid on markets uh, and earn a lot of money, by the way, on it. So we're using machine learning in order to estimate the marginal origin of electricity. And I unfortunately don't have time to go into the details here, but what we're basically doing is we're looking at all of Electricity Map's historical data, and we're looking at historically every hour when there has been a change in the system from one hour to the other, where did that change come from? Did it come from a change that is due to a change in consumption? For example, someone plugging their EV in and that causes an increase in demand of the system or from something that is independent on consumption. For example, the fact that when the wind starts blowing, we would turn off some gas or coal turbines. Uh, so there's a substitution effect, and this has nothing to do with the consumption changing over time. And then we're putting all of our electricity map data into this system um, in, order, in, in this equation in order to solve it. And that yields us um, those examples where we're reconstructing historical time series, both of generation on the left side, but also interconnectors. And that enables us to understand where, do the, where does the marginal electricity come from? Does it come from local generation or does it come from interconnectors? So this matrix you have here shows countries on each axis. So on the diagonal, you have average situations that show you on average when this marginal electricity is demanded, where does it come from? Does it come from local generation? So local generation is the diagonal and off diagonal terms showcase interconnectors. And using some math that I'm not gonna explain here, we can even detect nth order correlations. So for example, Denmark is not directly connected to Finland However, we see that when there's a change of consumption in Denmark, it actually causes in the end a change of generation in Finland. And this is fascinating because that enables us to understand on a much finer level, what should we do if we really want to optimize our electricity system? So this is a curve that showcases the results uh, for Eastern Denmark, where we have in blue, the carbon intensity of the system. So that's the average carbon intensity that is what you would see on the electricity map and then in yellow you have the marginal carbon intensity and you can see that it's typically lower typically because we tend to balance our system in Denmark a lot with the interconnectors from Nordic countries which have green electricity but you have some times where that's not true and where you can see that actually the marginal electricity is higher than the average meaning we would balance it with some dirtier peaking plant type of electricity. Um, so that also happens. What do you do with all of this? The interesting thing you can do is you can, for example, answer the question of where should we install more renewables? For example, um, when you install a wind turbine in say Norway, you will cause a removal or substitution of existing production. When that wind turbine produces electricity, something else is not gonna be produced. And in Norway, you almost guarantee that you will remove hydropower um, and replace that with wind. So the net CO2 benefit is close to zero. However, if you go to a country like Poland, you're quite sure that when your wind turbine is going to generate electricity, it is coal power plants that will not generate it. So that gives you an idea of what is the return on investment almost from a CO2 perspective. Um, and you can use that to make better decisions. Another thing is you can, use, you can utilize this information in order to optimize the time of use of electricity. So for example, at Google, now they're using this type of data in order to worldwide, worldwide sorry, optimize the usage in their data centers. So you have a lot of very big computations, algorithms, trainings, business analytics, and so on that are flexible. And so they can use the information in order to move those computations to times where the electricity 
is low carbon. And they can also do things like shifting things in space as well, moving things to countries where currently the electricity is low carbon. And that's fascinating. And as one of the only uh, companies in the world, I've seen Google uh, being very, very ambitious with their energy journey. And you can see here that they started with carbon neutrality. They, um, since 2017, focused on the 100% renewable energy targets, which is the certificate system I talked about before. And now they're focusing on having hour by hour carbon free energy by 2030. So they will be physically low carbon and they will have to utilize electricity at the right time, install batteries, have rooftop solar, and so on. And I believe that's extremely exciting if we can get all companies in the world that use a lot of electricity to have a similar goal to be physically carbon free hour by hour. And this is the preliminary, preliminary sorry, results that we're getting. And this will be a, almost the end of my presentation. So you can see here, this is a typical day uh, at Google's data centers. And you can see here that there's a peak of carbon intensity of emissions at noon, where a lot of people utilize data centers and their electricity. And you can see their baseline load is in orange. This is business as usual. And you can see that now they have the carbon aware load. So using electricity at the right time, they're able to shift consumption to times where the carbon intensity is lower, thereby reducing emissions. And I hope to be able to present some more quantified results um, soon. So this will be my, my last slide. Um, our ambition at Tomorrow is to enable a data-driven transition to a low carbon future. And I would really engage everyone and challenge you to think about what data are you using in order to power your transition? Because it is only by having some data that follows the physics that we will be able to do uh, a proper and efficient transition to a low carbon future. And with that, um, I guess we'll, we'll leave a bit of time for, uh, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. That was very, very clear. And I must say that it was so clear that all questions have died because you have been so excellent <laughs> in your presentation. <laughs> However, I would like to put a small question to you, and that is, what do you think have been the most fascinating thing of working in your company and combining that with the city's work? I think, I think we are at a very difficult intersection of many different challenges because we need to operate with citizens to convince them and educate them. We need to operate with companies to make sure we have a business model and we need to work with the academic world in order to make research and to make sure that we have the right standards that are put into place. Um, and I think for us, the Cities Project has been very, very good in order to be able to collaborate with the academic world, collaborate as well to policymakers afterwards, publish some results. And this is the only way that we can, you know, in this triad, be able to push the world to a better direction. And this is something quite unique and quite difficult as well for a startup. Uh, most startups would typically address only with one type of actor, directly talking to companies, and that's it. Um, and I think the public, you know, uh, the, the relationship that startups can have with the research world, specifically in Denmark, with the setup that we have, is quite unique. And there's a lot of other countries that don't have this unique setup, so I'm very proud that we in Denmark are able to have this type of collaboration. And Cities is a perfect example of that. Olivier, that's fantastic. I just learned that uh, Henrik Messen also has a question um, and I will see if I can give the word to Henrik so he can give the question right away. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Olivier. It was an excellent speech. Um, so my, my question is also that when you compare things, I fully agree with you that, and also Erste and this, uh, all, all other partners of CC will come back to these uh, issues that we need to have a correct uh, uh, green taxes as soon as possible or, or whatever we call it. Uh, but what about the LCA? Uh, when you compare different cars and so on, uh, and carbon leakage and so on, uh, is that on your agenda, on your radar? Because I think when it comes to the real time CO2 uh, uh, data, you, you are providing this uh, now, but, uh, but LCA is also an issue, I think. Yeah, so I think, I think you're opening up a huge box and it would take me 20 minutes to answer that question <laughs> correctly. And I, I, I see I don't have that time. Um, but in a nutshell, we, so what is, mean, what is important for us is to be able to provide the right signal that ends up having following, I mean, that ends up yielding real CO2 reductions. 
So if we want to do that, we of course need to, to come up with comparable answers. And if you don't take, for example, life cycle emissions into account, you will never be able to come with a proper uh, comparison between an electric vehicle, a hydrogen vehicle, and uh, a standard IC, like internal combustion engine vehicle. So in that sense, you have to take into account the whole value chain and else you will not be able to provide the right question. Um, so I think that's the shortest answer I'll, I'll give at this stage.